Welcome to MassBio's weekly town hall with President and CEO Bob Coughlin. I'm Jennifer Nason, Senior Director of Communications at MassBio, and we're thrilled to have with us today Michael Sherman, Chief Medical Officer at Harvard Pilgrim Healthcare. Welcome, Michael. Welcome, Bob. Well, thanks, Jenny, and thank you to everybody for joining us for this week's town hall. We're so excited today. We're going to shift it up a little bit, and instead of talking about what we're doing as a, a specifically as a life science industry and what's going on in diagnostics and uh, therapies and vaccines and back to work and all that stuff, we're going to shift it up and we're going to talk to our friend, Dr. Michael Sherman, who is over at Harvard Pilgrim Healthcare. And Dr. Sherman is a dear friend to our industry in that he has been paving the way nationally as it relates to um, value-based contracting. And he's really a leader in the field to figure out how we can absorb high cost yet high value therapies into our system. He's a dear friend. He's someone who I have a tremendous amount of respect for. We love working uh, with Harvard Pilgrim uh, as an industry and we're honored to have you here, Dr. Sherman, today. And I'll tell you, it's wonderful to see your face. We get to, in normal times, we get to sit on many panels and we, see we each do. other quite, quite often. And I miss you, so it's great to see your face. So we'll go back to you, Jenny. Thank you, Bob, and thank you, Michael, again, for joining us. Um, just a bit of housekeeping before we dive in. Um, as always, we want this to be an interactive discussion, so please ask questions throughout, and we'll get to as many as we can. Um, so over the last few town halls, we've heard from guests about how COVID has impacted hospitals, big pharma, and biotech startups. So Michael, can you tell us a little bit about how COVID has impacted the insurance business? You know, what new challenges has it brought for insurers, your subscribers, and the providers you work with? Yeah, um, and uh, that's a great question, and, and thank you for having me. You know, um, and everything, um, you know, what Bob said is kind comments. It's all mutual. Um, Bob is a class act, and I've always respected him, his colleagues, and all the people I've worked with, with Mass Value and beyond. So um, it, it's pretty great to be here. And again, there are so many touch points here. Um, so there's the work we do with you. Um, you know, on the life sciences side on how do we make new products accessible and not let what may be a high but fair starting price, for example, get in the way of the people who need these drugs. And that, that hasn't changed. Um, you know, all, we and, and you and everyone though are also looking at it as an employer, for example, how do you think about return to work safely and, and everything that goes into that and, and taking care of your employees. And then, um, you know, there are, you know, other discussions underway and about, again, from our perspective, on the insurer side. And again, these truly are uncharted territories and I feel like we're making it up as we go along. So some of the things that we're seeing and, and doing quite frankly. So first of all, um, you know, there's a concern that we've shut down a lot of elective care and gone to virtual. And um, you know, there's some positives and negatives there. First of all, um, financially, um, we're in decent shape. Um, um, frankly, it seems that the additional cost of COVID together with virtual care and others uh, seems to be less than what we would have spent otherwise, mm. making it seem like the industry is doing well. Um, that, that is true, except as I remind everyone, um, it's a more nuanced answer. So first of all, the estimate is that 70 to 80% of things that are avoided will come back. So if you're delaying your colonoscopy, you're still going to have one done. If you're delaying your total knee or total hip, you're probably going to have it done as well. And some of this will shift into next year, we believe. So while the financials are good, and frankly, we want to do our part to support the industry because it's about the ecosystem, not about us isolated, I remind everyone, it really is the employer's money. And that's true if you're a small company and self-insured where you expect just like, I mean, we've got auto um, insurance uh, premium checks, some of us, uh, because we're driving less. Um, so I, you know, the employers, you know, it's, again, it's their money. Um, and uh, same for the larger self-insured, you know, it, it is an issue. But that said, you know, right now we worry about how everyone is doing. We've made some changes. Um, so, for example, we've embraced virtual care. We actually used to, for example, only cover it as a benefit if we're a video. Now we're allowing it telephonic. Um, we used to, um, you know, um, pay less for a virtual visit to the provider. We've said, you know, for the time being, we're going to pay the same amount. It's very hard to get anyone in. It's the right thing to do that we want to support the system. And probably most important, and I feel really good about this, we're actually not charging any copay. 
And that, that, oh, there's a lot of regulations out there. There's regs, this comes up all the time in life sciences. What, what, what is the right thing to do? What do the regs say? Sometimes there are differences. So there are a lot of regulations that said you should cover any COVID related care without any cost share. And there's good reasons for that, right? We don't want that to be limiting people's getting testing or treatment. We've gone a step further and said, if you have virtual care for any reason, COVID related or otherwise, there, there is no cost share. And so one of the things is we're showing that um, you know a lot of things that could be done virtually that aren't done because of people's discomfort can be done well, and I think that will persist. And again, it's helping prevent people from um, you know from avoiding care because worried about the cost, and that's particularly important because when you also see unemployment numbers, many of those are people are moving from employer-sponsored insurance to exchanges and the like. So we're doing a lot there. And then finally, I'll say briefly, it's more an issue for the providers. We've eliminated generally our prior authorization and concurrent review and all the stuff that providers don't like that to try to ensure that low value care isn't delivered given the low number of elective cases and the like. So we're trying to make it easier from that perspective. So a lot of stuff happening. And then also we've donated several million uh, dollars from our foundation to get food to people. And um, we even have a, a testing facility in our Quincy office parking lot. So there's a whole lot going on in the industry. Now, if I could just follow up on that, uh, Dr. Sherman, thank you. And thank you to all of the folks at your company for what you've been doing to be part of the solution during this. I mean, we in the life sciences industry have gotten a lot of credit because there's over close to 80 companies right now, believe it or not, that are working on either diagnostics, therapies, or ultimately vaccines. And we'll talk more about that later in our discussion. But I mean, your industry has stepped up as well. I will tell you, and MassBio is a customer to Harvard Pilgrim. And uh, I know that as a customer, three out of the five people in my family, and one of them being a cystic fibrosis patient, has utilized, you know, this Zoom appointment with our doctors. And we, we hadn't done that ever in the past and the support that we received from Harvard Pilgrim to do that was amazing and it has been effective. I mean, I don't think it's a solution for everything, obviously, but in the interim to make sure that people are still keeping up with their wellness, uh, I, I think it's truly been amazing. So thank you for that. Well, you're welcome. I'll also add on the drug side specifically, um, you know, we're, we're encouraging people. I was actually worried about drug shortages from supply mm -hmm. lines. A lot of the APIs come from China and, and India, et cetera. So I was worried. And again, it, it, it's not been a problem yet, but we immediately said, let's encourage everyone to do 90 day fills. And then we realized mm -hmm. that some people just filled it for 30 days at the pharmacy. The system won't let you do that. So we changed the system to allow people to do that. So this is one of those times. I mean, it's true in the pharma industry too. I, I'm really... I feel very good about what I do and what we all do because people are doing the right thing and it, it just feels good to be, you know, collaborating and doing that and not worried about the optics and the politics. Yeah, I do know that 60 days ago, a lot of people were worried about that 30 day supply for all their meds and you immediately, immediately switched to 90 days and that gave people the comfort knowing that they were going to have their meds for, for however long this pandemic was going to take. Yeah, thank you, Bob, and thank you, Michael, for sharing all those details. I mean, it sounds like the insurance industry is adapting quickly to this environment. Um, but let's talk a little bit about what you mentioned about how people are avoiding some of those, you know, surgeries or doctor's appointments that they're now pushing off and what ramifications that has. So how can we work together? I mean, insurers, biopharma providers to assure people that they need to continue to take care of themselves and, you know, entirely, not just around COVID, while still being able to address those COVID-related needs. Yeah, there's, so there's a lot of implications that are coming out of um, the pandemic crisis. Um, you know, um, many of them very concerning, of course. Um, you know, but first of all, if, if there's a positive, if there's a silver lining here, you know, um, you know, many industries, including the life sciences industry, there's been some, a lot of bad press on occasion and people have a political ax to grind or whatever. And all that stuff is no longer on the front page. And instead, everyone is focusing on what your um, stakeholders and others across the nation are doing to, to create a drug pipeline that we've never seen before. So um, I, I just, first of all, the positive here is that the conversation has changed one which I find much more productive. And you know, as, as I always tell people, you know, you can bash the farm industry all you want to, but when I sit down with people, the people I sit down with on the other side of the table, I respect, their, you know, and this is, forget your headlines, this is my firsthand, you know, experience. They're well-intentioned, they're doing this because they care, they frequently have family members 
who had challenges with rare diseases or, or some other chronic conditions and they care and that's why we can work together. So the fact that we're getting away from some of the other negativity, which is not helpful, it, it is a positive. But to your other point, um, you know, I, I, you know the, there are concerns here. So we're seeing um, not just um, low value care being avoided and elective care, but non-elective care. So um, whether it's colonoscopies, um, or, um, or, or other, you know, or immunizations, you know, we're keeping an eye on that. And as soon as we're able to, again, it appears maybe sooner rather than later in Massachusetts, um, particularly for, for preventive care and the like, um, we're, you know, we, we worry about that as, as an industry because as you know, we do those things and, and, you know, we do, as an industry and we as, as patients because they're, they're, they're good for us. So we, you know, we worry about those numbers and what happens if immunizations lag for too long. We're trying to, to work with people and providers to make sure that as soon as the things are lifted, it's addressed. There's other issues where it's a little more complicated. So for example, there's fewer, less people driving, that's good. Fewer um, people um, and the accidents, which is good. Um, there's also fewer organ donations. So if you're kind of on that side of the equation, um, you know, it, it, it's problematic for those individuals. So it's, it's you know, it is um, a very complicated picture. Uh, the other thing is I honestly worry as much about people's mental health as, as I do their physical yeah. health. So, um, you know, I mean, great that you're healthy, but the question is, are people going to lose their minds? And, we're, you know, we're doing what we can, which is everything from online Zumba and yoga to whatever for our members and for the public. Um, to, you know, encouraging our employees, um, not speaking as an employer, to uh, take time off, um, to check out, to um, understanding that if people have children at home who are being virtually schooled, as, as I do and many, I know many people here on this uh, webinar have that issue, to be flexible. So um, there's a lot of implications here for public health. There's also a lot of confusion, I, I think, um, and I, you know, before this, I actually did my bi-weekly update to my organization where we talk about a lot of the facts. And I think that's important because there's, you know, here's you can turn three different networks on, get the same information presented in a way that, um, that leads you to different conclusions, and then maybe turn on a political briefing and then get even more confused. So times like that, I think we need to talk about the facts. And, and although there's a lot of, um, again, confusion, you know, I, I think we've seen a, a very strong pipeline for the drug industry. So that gives us reason to be optimistic, but some recent positive data from Desivere. And then on the vaccine side, you can look at it as, you know, the best case was mumps, which is four years, it can take decades. All but on the other hand, we've never seen this kind of concerted effort before. And we're, we've seen data come out of Oxford. We saw data yesterday out of Moderna. Mm -hmm. um, which, you know, um, and, you know, and I, I tend to be a little restrained. I was excited about that. And I told, you know, my colleagues, I said, this is important. Let's talk about what they showed and why it's important. And um, frankly, we should all feel a lot more optimistic than we did 24 hours ago. So yes, vaccine development is hard, but we've never had an industry, whether it's drugs for one therapeutic area or a vaccine, so focused in, in this kind of concerted effort. You know, if I could add to that, uh, you know, Dr. Sherman, you and I have talked for over a decade now about the value of healthcare and how do we keep people well? How do we, you know, treat symptoms and how do we get to treat the under ca uh, underlying cause of disease so that we can really save money and save lives, right? And you, you talked about the image of the industry. And I think now is a time that as an industry, we have an opportunity to really show our better side, right? And why we do what we do. Who would have thought a year ago when you and I were talking about value-based payments and how do we really show that, you know, these breakthrough novel therapeutics that change the underlying cause of disease could actually save money in the healthcare system if we do this right. And who would have thought that a vaccine would be the most important thing to the world's economy, right? It's almost like I'm having trouble some nights wrapping my head around this because obviously I came to the industry because I was working with this industry to try to come up with a therapy that would, you know, change the course of cystic fibrosis in my son's body. And you're extremely well versed in that. You know all about that. And, and to think now that it's almost like people everywhere know what it feels like to need a medicine that can keep them safe, 
and or get them back to their regular course of activities during their daily lives. This is an incredible time. And I think it's an opportunity for your industry and our industry to work collabor collaboratively to ensure that the patients and the people of the world know that we're doing this for all the right reasons. If a bad actor pops up now, it's so important that we call them out and don't allow it immediately during all of this. Yeah, I think that's true on both sides. Again, you can have bad, you know, as you know, there's, there's insurers that do things that are embarrassing. Um, Absolutely. So, I mean, it's, you know, and, you know, when in doubt, do the right thing, you know. So, you know, we had a um, request just yesterday for Zolgensma. That's the most expensive drug there is. And because it's of what it is, it, it came to me personally. And someone's crazy issue. There are some, I think there were LFT, there were some lab abnormalities that were fairly minor. And so they raised it not as a yes, no, but as a question. And I, and I said, what's the right thing to do here? What would you want if it were your child? I, you know, I said, yes, there are some lab abnormalities that the, if, if, you know, if the practicing physician who's, you know, an expert on this at Children's is wanting to do this, I, let's cover it. So the answer is, I, that's a short discussion. The answer is yes. So, you should, I mean, part of it is not hiding behind um, those kind of gotchas, you know, they're they're five days older than the label or two months older. I mean, it's really about what would you want if it were your child? And, you know, that's how I keep my sanity in this industry, thinking mm -hmm. what if it were your family member? What's the right thing to do? And that, that usually gives her the right answer. So, yeah, there's, um, it's exciting time. So, yes, it feels like it's all COVID all the time, um, certainly for me. And um, mm -hmm. I actually treasure those calls that are not about COVID, but I continue yeah. to meet with innovative life sciences companies, um, uh, generally virtually, but um, we're having productive meetings. Um, again, the fact is we still have a very robust life um, pipeline of life-changing medications coming to the market. They're going to be, again, as I've said before, uh, they're going to likely be expensive given the cost of development and, and the rarity. They're also going to be drugs that if it were your family member, you or were you, you would want them to be available. So that means that despite all of this COVID distraction, if you would, we also need to continue all the good efforts we've been doing to collaborate and make sure that as these come to market, that we make them accessible to patients who need the most. And again, that, that to me has always been the fun part. Um, I'll also add that, uh, you know, the other, you know, we're all busy, you know, I see it as my usual stuff and uh, all the COVID things. And then we also have this um, integration underway with Cuff's Health Plan with whom we're combining yeah which is on track for a Q4. So I'm really excited about that. Um, you know, it, um, it will double our size and frankly make us much larger in Medicare Advantage and put us into Medicaid, which, which you know, we, um, for better or worse, not been in before. So, you know, I, I'm just so excited about having the, that, um, you know, that larger population to manage and to work with the industry. And, you know, as I remind my staff now, when, uh, when we're looking at what we can do, I say we need to make sure, we need to figure out where they live in NUCO. We still don't have a name for the combined organization. But I want to make sure that we don't drop anything. And even in a discussion the other day about, um, you know, about some diagnostics, I said, well, how are we thinking about um, NUCO? And when is it going to be live? And how do we think about bringing that population into this value-based agreement? So, um, it, you know, it's exciting to me for a lot of reasons, but also, um, impacting twice the population side with respect to a lot of these rare conditions and doing the right thing. What does that mean when you take uh, when you take Tufts and Harvard Pilgrim and combine them into NUCO? What does that mean geographically? Just so our audience has an understanding of the merger. So you know, right now Harvard Pilgrim alone is in four states: uh, Mass, New Hampshire, Maine, and small in Connecticut. Um, they're in um, heavily in Mass, small, smaller in New Hampshire, and uh, small in Connecticut, and small in Rhode Island. So I guess we'll be in another state. But mm -hmm. so probably the more impactful piece is right now we're about 98% commercial, 2% Medicare Advantage. They have like half a million Medicaid lives, and they have 100,000 plus Medicare lives. So it's really going to be much more balanced. Um, you know, and um, you know, and just to be clear, I view my job even more than in the past as being out there, innovative, working with. Um, you know, great um, partners. And um, so, you know, and, and that's going to continue, you know, in NUCO certainly in terms of how we're building the infrastructure. So again, um, it's, it's exciting. It is exciting. Great. That's very exciting. And you both hit on so many important points around here, just about kind of the silver lining in some of this debate. I mean, Bob, we spent all of 2019 educating our members on this evolving value access reimbursement landscape and this drug pricing debate. And now it feels like it's just evaporated and like you yeah. said everyone understands the true value that our industry brings to patients and the economy 
Um, and a big part of that debate we talked about was how digital health and these digital technologies were helping to support that move to outcomes-based payment models, right? And, and that to really be able to measure the true value in terms of costs avoided and keeping people healthy. So maybe you could both talk a little bit about how this time period is gonna accelerate that move to kind of value-based care and is gonna change the way we deliver and pay for healthcare services you know, in the long term. Why don't you go first, Michael? Yeah, so um, you know that's that's a great point. So similar to telemedicine, which is one aspect, um, you know, we're, we're we're learning that we need to do a lot of things virtually. Um, that we, because, whereas right now we can't do them in person. And my belief is, once we can do them in person, people are going to realize eighty percent of this we could do virtually. So um, there, we're looking at a whole. I mean, we've been doing this anyway. I think it will accelerate. But there are apps and devices. Digital therapeutics is kind of a you know, catch basin, if you would, but you know, it includes you know monitoring technology. It includes uh, things around adherence. It includes apps. So we we even before this, we started with a company, Wellframe. So you know, we we have our nurse care managers and reach out to individuals who may have are confused, who have complicated conditions, and work with them and their physicians to make sure they understand everything. And, you know, and and uh, you know, are maximizing the benefits and you know, understand, for example, what do you do if you miss a dose or something? All sorts of questions. So now with Wellframe, for example. Um, we can have those that dialogue through an app with reminders and things that, um, and again, we that preceded the COVID crisis. There are there are you know dozens of those that we look at. Um, there are, you know, companies that help with women's health and fertility and and you know, other issues relating to pregnancy. Um, there you know there is remote monitoring with feedback loops that help guide um, you know guide the individual. And again, I, I thought we've been moving on those, but the industry overall, I think, has been moving less quickly than it could. And I think this is going to accelerate the adoption of these kind of digital technologies because we understand how important they are. And uh, again, nothing like having a blow to the system, um, even when things normalize. So, you know, I mean, even with our return to work, just digressing for a second, with our, when we have this work group, et cetera, and this to all companies, um, there are those who think, some people never want to return to the office. Maybe we need smaller offices. We've shown we, what we can do virtually. And I think similarly, you'll see an understanding now and maybe a greater trust and comfort level because some of it has been maybe, some of the underinvestment has been based on, in some cases, it's hard to get individuals to adopt these technologies. So I think all, all the fundamentals here are very strong for, for growth. Absolutely. Bob, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I mean, when you think big picture here, and we have talked about the silver lining that's come of this pandemic, and again, don't get me wrong, this is catastrophic. It's been so destructive to so many families and lives and people in the restaurant industry, and there's just so much rebuilding that we're going to have to do. That being said, what are some of the things we've learned that can carry through to make us bigger, when, better when we come out the other side? Transportation and congestion was one of the biggest issues facing our economy, and this force to people, including myself, to buy into work from home policies and this virtual nature and continuing to be efficient is something in this telehealth piece. I don't see it going away afterwards, okay? That's a great exactly. thing to solve other problems. When you look at drug discovery, one of the reasons that Massachusetts has become the best place in the world for this industry is because academia, industry, and government truly worked in a true, in a collaborative nature. Today, it's more collaborative than it's ever been. And I think that will continue through this. When you look at how we have all pulled together to solve this, the, the needs that would come up rapidly, and th these are life and death, like the supply hub, by pulling together all of the PPE that we had in our industry to make it available for frontline healthcare workers. The work, uh, the, the collaboration and the camaraderie that I see amongst the different stakeholders now is extraordinary and it's wonderful. When you look at drug discovery, I mean, it, Dr. Sherman, we've talked about the fact that it took 18 years and over $13 billion to invent a drug that finally worked for my own kid. Mm -hmm. We are forced to do things less in a silo right now. We have, what are there, nine companies in clinical trials 
right now uh, for vaccines. Two of them are from Massachusetts. Yes. When you look at how these clinical trials are going to be executed, these companies are working together. So, so that camaraderie of the small companies has, mm -hmm. that behavior has translated and been forced up the stream to the large companies. These large companies now are talking about how they're going to manufacture. The, whoever invents it, they're almost rooting for each other that somebody can do yeah. it first, and then they'll all work together to manufacture the billions of doses that we're going to need to eradicate this illness, right, and to build up yep. that Absolutely. immunity that's required. So I just don't think that I've ever seen AI, digital health, diagnostics, and the therapeutics and vaccines folks working with academic medical centers to solve this problem in a record amount of time. Let's get through COVID-19, ladies and gentlemen, and then apply that same sense of urgency to Alzheimer's, to ALS, to Duchenne muscular dystrophy, and so many other types of cancers that we've been talking about. And that's how we promote wellness. And that's how we change the curve. And that's how our industry and the amazing folks at Harvard Pilgrim Health and Tufts and NUCO can all continue to work together to, to, to be better. I'm getting excited right now here in my yeah. office. Me, me too. I, I couldn't agree more because, you know, again, this will have an end. And again, to your point, everything we've learned will persist. And again, this is a bad situation. We all know that. But at the end of the day, we're going to come out better. We're going to learn a lot. And we're going to be more efficient, more effective in innovating and bringing products to market. That's mm -hmm. what's important. Absolutely. Um, and I know we only have a few minutes remaining, but just in, in the vein of keeping everything really timely, um, Governor Baker's plan to reopen mass, you know, just came out yesterday. I'm wondering if, you know, maybe Bob, you can start and then Michael, just some quick reactions to, to what you thought of the plan he laid out. I, I mean, our industry was involved as well as many other industries. I think one, the governor is in a situation where people aren't going to be happy one way or another. And the way they came, went about gathering information from all the different stakeholders, one, they listened, okay? They listened and they were thoughtful, they were cautious, they balanced the right amount of risk with cautiousness to try to protect people. And I, and I think it's data driven. Uh, what's, what, what we're really doing and what the administration is really doing here is they're slowly opening the economy, it needs to happen. Uh, and they're doing it in a way that they can measure, they've set metrics and they can measure it to know to continue to open or to perhaps constrict in the event that surveillance will show that there's flare-ups happening again. The whole point is to do this in a way that you can say, be, do it as safely as possible and always prevent the amount of sick people to exceed the amount of bandwidth that we can take in our healthcare system. And I think they've done that. So I, I, I'm, I'm pleased with the administration and the, the thoughtfulness that they put into reopening our economy. Yeah, I, I, I could not um, agree more. Um, I think that we're doing this in a very thoughtful way, more so than in many other states, as, as mm -hmm. we tend to be cautiously. And again, the worst thing we could do here is to um, act in a way that is imprudent and have people die. Right, that that's not what we're, you know. That that's what we're trying to avoid. Um, I think we will get back to some normalcy with some spikes and troughs until there's a vaccine, which is why that's where everyone's rooting for that. And um, in the meantime, I you know I think using good judgment, whether it is where you go and how you go and how you conduct yourself, or how we go about reopening our offices and determining what can we do virtually, what do we need to be in person, how do we protect people, that's all part of the equation. But I, I think we're doing it right in this state. Perfect. Thank you both for those thoughts. Um, and we're just coming up to time, but I just wanted to make um, one announcement. For those who don't know, MassBio actually has an exclusive partnership with Harvard Pilgrim Healthcare to provide benefits to our members. So we do have a series of webinars coming up. It's called Edge Benefits. So if you go to massbio.org to our events calendar, you can register for those and learn more about how you can take advantage of all the incredible benefits and offerings that Harvard Pilgrim has. So Michael, thank you so much. Um, just do you have any kind of parting words before we end? It's been great to have you on. No, just um, that, you know, the, these are turbulent times. Don't lose sight of the big picture and all the good that we're doing as an industry together. And, uh, you know, the days are stressful. We're home with maybe family members who we'd like to be in school or later on at summer camp, but so it's easy to get stressed. And, um, you know, but again, um, diff difficult situation. We're going to get through it and we're going to come out of this stronger. Perfect. Thank you, Michael. How about you, Bob? You want to end us uh, on a high note? You bet. I just want to thank Dr. Michael Sherman and all of the folks at Harvard Pilgrim for being so 
concerned about patients. I mean, we're in the industry of solving unmet medical need. They're in the industry of making sure that access is there for folks who need it. Nobody could do a better job. And Michael, it's an honor to be your friend. You're, you're always a physician first. You're always a doctor first. And it's always so refreshing to hear you talk about the way you care about your members and the, the, the patient's uh, that are in your community. And as a customer, I can say firsthand for many, many years now that your company has never let me down and you've never let you know my family members down. And for that, I thank you because you certainly set the bar over there as it relates to patient care. You're a wonderful human. All mutual. Thank you as well for everything that you do on your side. It takes two to collaborate. Thank you, you for being a leader. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. We'll see you next week. Have a good Memorial Day weekend. Bye. Thanks. Bye-bye.